Hello, I'm Aronetta Pierce, Tri-Chair of the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee. The committee was established in 2014 to develop the vision and guiding principles that serve as the foundation for the Alamo Plan. In the summer of 2021, we hosted seven content discussion meetings to explore the layered stories of the Alamo. I am pleased to present this meeting on the civil rights movement in San Antonio. The discussion takes us to a more recent period in history and examines how the area around the Alamo was the staging grounds for some of the demonstrations for equality. The Alamo has always been a place of historic importance for free speech. Politicians and activists have used the Alamo Church as a backdrop for sparking hope and encouraging activism. The Civil Rights Movement had some powerful moments around the Alamo, including to the Northwest along Houston Street, as Woolworths and other lunch counters became integrated. San Antonio played a pivotal role in the Mexican-American Civil Rights Movement, both in Texas and the nation. The Civil Rights Movement in San Antonio was progressive. After many strategic meetings of local black and white ministers organizations, the San Antonio chapter of the NAACP, the military commands, and the downtown business leaders, there followed the peaceful integration of local lunch counters. Yet at other times, San Antonio lagged behind the rest of the country in passing supportive legislation. Lunch counters on Houston Street were part of the peaceful integration including Woolworths on the northwest corner of the historic Alamo grounds. It is important that we embrace the continuum of time to show how events from the past are directly reflected into today. The events of the northwest corner reveal the Alamo's historic significance, not only of the past, but also as time continues forward. Hearing first-person accounts of inequality discrimination, and denial of rights that we take for granted today can help us to better understand, assess, and document events from the past. Hosting this meeting at the Majestic Theater helped us to highlight some of those stories. Good evening and welcome to the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee content discussion series. Uh, tonight we are here to talk about the civil rights movement. Uh, thank you for joining us and we'll begin with a welcome from Emily Smith, General Manager of the Majestic Theater and Doran Fine of the Las Casas Foundation. Good evening. Welcome to the Majestic Theater. We are so happy that you're here with us this evening on the Majestic stage. The Majestic Theater opened in 1929 it is an atmospheric theater designed to transport audiences to a whimsical fantasy land. The Majestic, created by John Everson, was created to make audiences feel like they are in a Mediterranean villa or Spanish villa under the starry night sky, surrounded by 27 birds, including a magnificent white peacock over here over my left shoulder. Eberson, during his time, designed about 100 atmospheric theaters. Today, there are 17, 16 or 17 atmospheric theaters faithfully restored and still operating in the United States. And we are so fortunate that the Majestic Theater in San Antonio, Texas is one of them. And that would not be possible without the work of the Las Casas Foundation. And I'd like to introduce to you Doran Fine with Las Casas Foundation. Thank you for being here. Good evening and welcome to the Majestic Theater. Las Casas Foundation was founded to restore this beautiful gym um, of Houston Street in San Antonio. And our Las Casas Foundation's mission is to develop the performing arts through education and scholarships and restoration and preservation of historic theaters. While we are still remain to be stewards to the Majestic and Charlene McCombs Empire Theaters, our focus is also on the future of the arts to ensure that we have audience members and 
performers, and we have developed the Jossie Awards, which is our scholarship program, where Las Casas Foundation awards over $100,000 in scholarships to high schoolers every year. And we welcome you all to, to join us next May for the Jossie Awards and celebrate the talent in San Antonio. And thank you very much for being here. We hope you enjoy um, your time in the spotlight on stage. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite our tribe chair, uh, Ms. Araneta Pierce, to come give us our, our opening for the evening. I'd like to thank the, those who welcomed us to the theater. And uh, I'd like to share with you that it is a special thing for me to be here in the Majestic Theater because uh, I was a charter member of the Las Casas board that restored the Majestic and Empire theaters. And I cannot come in these theaters without thinking of the grand doyen of San Antonio, my sweet dear friend, Jocelyn Strauss, who led the effort to restore these theaters. And if she were here, she'd say, enjoy all the beauty. But I always remember the night of the opening, Jossie and I were going through the lobby and we had drinks in our hands and somebody wanted to take a photograph of us. And so I put my drink down on the carpet and her first response was, oh, it may spill on the carpet. And she had gone through every bit of restoration of every inch of this place, and so it meant everything to her. So I just wanted to say that and to pay tribute to her and to thank the Majestic and the Las Casas Foundation for being such great stewards of this special place. Good evening again to all of you, and thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to especially thank my shoulders that I rest on, my tri-chairs, Rebecca Villagran and Sue Ann Pemberton. Thank you so kindly. I'd also like to rec recognize, I don't think they're here, Laurie Houston and Kate Rogers. Our interpretive museum consultants from PGAV Destinations and Gallagher Associates are also here to listen. And as a reminder, this is our final content discussion meeting of the summer. Videos of all the meetings are available on the city's website and YouTube channel. And we encourage you to go back and look at all of them. The Alamo has always been a place of historic importance for free speech. Politicians and activists have used the Alamo Church as a backdrop for sparkling hope and encouraging activism. The Civil Rights Movement had some powerful moments around the Alamo, including to the northwest along Houston Street as Woolworths and other lunch counters became integrated. San Antonio played an, a pivotal role in the Mexican-American Civil Rights Movement, both in Texas and in the nation. I'd like to thank the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee, the real wind beneath our wings who serve as the theme captains to help plan this meeting. That would be Patricia Mejia, Sharon Aguillan, Carrie Lattimore, and Rudy Rodriguez. I'd like to just take a moment as we are talking about civil rights and caring for people to think of the people in Haiti and the people in Afghanistan who, as we speak, are running for their very lives. I have prepared comments for you. However, I don't know how many of you were at the program this morning for the groundbreaking. Could you raise your hands? Great. Uh, I had planned to be there but I was feeling a little unwell later in the evening last night and I decided I needed to save my energy for this meeting because as you may or may not realize, some of these sessions are a little challenging emotionally as we go back through everything and study everything. So I wanted to be ready. And then I got a call after this morning's session program of concern that there were only three African Americans in the audience this morning at the Alamo. And I also uh, heard uh, 
Commissioner Rebecca Clay Flores. <laughs> Thank you. That's number one, but I promise you there'll be more. Francisco is holding my back. Um, and I heard her on uh, NPR as I was driving downtown, and she was commenting on that absence today. And the fact that we say we're going to tell all the stories, and yet where, were the, where was the diversity this morning? So I, I wasn't there, I, I would have been there. I would have been number five. But um, it's something to think about. When we say we use the plaza, we do this, we have to stop and think that we does not mean everybody. And it's so ingrained in our lives that we don't realize it. But I implore you to think. To my prepared notes, finally, and I'm, on I'm gonna try to be on time. Civil rights are an essential component of a democracy. They are guarantees by the powers of the state to equal social opportunities and protection under the law, regardless of race, religion, and other characteristics. For example, you are guaranteed the right to vote, to a fair trial, to government services, and to a public education. I am an American citizen. Like generations of Americans before me, I am required to pay taxes and obey the laws of the United States of America. But imagine that for as long as I can remember, there have been numerous assaults on the civil rights of black people and Latina people in San Antonio, particularly the right to vote. Through the brief advances by African Americans during the Reconstruction that ended in 1877, the onslaught of devastating prohibitions for African Americans have been consistent, compelling, and relentless. One after another, they have compounded our difficulties to live. Consider the institution of forced labor, which came right after Reconstruction. That was when African Americans were imprisoned for minor infractions and then forced to work wherever they were assigned. Then there were the Jim Crow laws, there was redlining, and the separate but equal doctrine, particularly notable for the inadequate funding for safe and well-equipped schools for black students. You can even compare the seating in the upper balcony for black people here in the Majestic Theater that, that included a back entrance and a ticket counter off the College Street with the seating for white patrons in the orchestra and mezzanine. Definitely separate but definitely not equal. I mention these examples to underscore the apartheid-like conditions under which black people lived in America until the beginning of the civil rights movement. Separate water fountains, separate restaurants, eating places in transportation places, and if at all bathrooms, they were separate, separate. The bus boycott initiated by Rosa Parks in Montgomery, Alabama, and then the sit-in movement are prime examples. High school and college students across the South were taught and rehearsed in the principles of nonviolent demonstrations so that they would not react violently if they were spit on or cursed by white people while sitting at the lunch counters, which happened in my hometown. These were simple acts of defiance, the sit-ins but they also inspired major evolutionary changes in access, opportunities, and civil rights for African Americans. These simple actions, the sit-ins, led to additional demonstrations of nonviolence such as freedom rides, marches, and boycotts. In my native Nashville, college students and the community opted not to shop downtown for New Easter outfits. There were no such things as shopping centers in those days and the boycott, boycott lasted many, many months. The subsequent loss to the economy caused the main department store downtown, it was called Harvey's, that would be the equivalent of our Joskies, closed down within the year. Because not only did African Americans not shop down, 
downtown, but others did not want to be caught in what might have been unpleasantness, so they didn't go at all. Today, it is because of the pivotal reforms that the civil rights movement produced that we meet today to discuss their impact on both the Latina and the African American community and to assure that this movement is not only remembered, but enshrined. I apologize for taking those minutes to do this off of the time schedule, but what we are doing is an exercise. What I am saying is a plea for life, for equal life. Our, we have two outstanding expert speakers to speak to us to, tonight. One of them, both of them I've known for a long time and watched them in their professional lives. Dr. Sarah, Sarah Zaneda Gould is Interim Executive Director of the Mexican American Civil Rights Institute. She has curated over a dozen exhibits on history, art, and culture, and is the founding director of the Museo del West Side, and was lead curatorial researcher at the Institute of Texas Cultures, which is where I got to know her when I was on the board there. She is co-founder and co-chair of Latinos in Heritage Conservation and an advisor to the National Trust for Historic Preservation. She received a BA in African American Studies from Smith College and an M a master's degree and a PhD in American Culture from the University of Michigan. She is a former fellow at the National Museum of American History, the Winterthur Museum, and the American Antiquarian Society, and is an alumna of the National Association of, Lat of Latino Arts and Culture Leadership Institute. The next speaker is Dr. Carrie H. Lattimore, a member of our, our committee, and allowed this special opportunity because he wrote, he was uh, commissioned and wrote the special report on civil rights in San Antonio. Dr. Carrie H. Lattimore is Associate Professor of History at Trinity University, where he is the co-director of the African American Studies Program and the past chair of the History Department. Groundbreaking. He holds a master's degree and a PhD in United States History from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and a BA from the University of Richmond in Virginia, his native Virginia. A specialist on African American and Southern history, Dr. Lattimore is particularly interested in the construction of African American communities in the Reconstruction and post-Reconstruction South. First, before they began, as is traditional, we will hear from Ms. Melissa Simmons from PGAV about how tonight's discussion aligns with the vision and guiding principles created by this committee. We will proceed after Melissa with Dr. Gould and then Dr. Lattimore, and we'll take a break. Thank you very much. As we embark on our seventh and final content discussion tonight, I wanted to reflect on our past discussions and the compelling histories we have heard. Looking back, we have talked about the Alamo in the context of six different lenses, some focusing on a specific period of time and some spanning many different eras. We have heard from 24 experts, including scholars, historians, archeologists, researchers, and specialists. And we have the pleasure of hearing from four more this evening. Our discussions have revolved around the research and interpretation of historical documents, archeology, span and other evidence to create a picture of the past. It is interesting that we are ending this content series on a topic where we still have living memories of events. Personal stories and oral histories from the 20th century provide a voice, an audible persona, to historic events, allowing us to hear the real people behind the story. The Alamo has been a site of so much history for centuries, but after the Battle of 1836, it became a symbol for freedom and liberty. From that time through to today, the Alamo has been used as a rallying point to spark hope and encourage activism. From Teddy Roosevelt to John F. Kennedy, politicians have used the Alamo Church as a backdrop for rallies and re-election campaign speeches. Activists have marched here to gain support for their cause, using the Alamo as a gathering place. 
Annual celebrations and ceremonies bring people from all backgrounds to the Alamo for events such as memorial services and military events. Bringing these stories to light will enable us to present the Alamo in the context of today, showing how the accumulation of history has led to the Alamo becoming the shrine of Texas liberty. We must expand the narrative to include the many voices in Alamo history. As one of our vision statements articulates, we need to include and interpret the diverse cultures that contributed to the story of the Alamo area through meaningful and memorable experiences for visitors. If we have learned nothing else from these discussions, it is that history is complex. As we look at the continuum of time, we can see that events are connected throughout history and into today. Including living memories of events from the past century brings the story into the present and looks at events that happened within the Alamo site in the recent past, adding yet another element to the history of the Alamo. As we discuss tonight's topic, we can keep in mind that this history will help us to engage local residents and visitors in ways to personally connect the Alamo area experience, as stated in the vision and guiding principles. Now I'd like to introduce Sarah. Thank you so much for having me join you tonight. Um, tonight, I'm going to address how is Alamo Plaza relevant to Mexican-American civil rights history? The story I'm going to share with you is not a dramatic story of demonstrations, protests, and boycotts. Rather, it's a story about belonging in a city of our ancestors. As I'm as I'm sure you all know, when the Spanish founded San Antonio in 1718, for them, it was little more than a Catholic mission and frontier military outpost, albeit located in an area that had been inhabited for 10,000 plus years. But that's another story. The settlement was far removed from the bustling urban life of Mexico City and frequently struggled to convince indigenous people to enter and stay in their new mission, as well as to convince citizens to permanently settle here. Spanish society was quite stratified along caste lines. So for people of lower castes, meaning people of any kind of mixed racial heritage or with little to no financial prospects, a move to San Antonio could lead to opportunities for advancement that were inaccessible in more desirable locations like Mexico City, Querétaro, or Saltillo. It was these folks who 13 years later were joined by the Canary Islanders in 1731, who by the late 1700s made San Antonio the center of Spanish Texas. So I just want to repeat that. By the late 1700s, San Antonio was the center of Spanish Texas. And then a few decades later, in 1821, when Mexico gained independence from Spain, San Antonio became the center of Mexican Texas. 15 years later, following the defeat of the Mexican army at San Jacinto, and Texas's independence from Mexico, people of Mexican descent, whatever side of the Texas Revolution they may have been on, found themselves systematically disenfranchised. In many cases, they had their land stripped from them, from those newly in power, and they were pushed to the margins of the city that they built. Um, the history of segregation in San Antonio is a little different from the segregation patterns in, for example, the Deep South. Like many other cities in the Southwest, people of Mexican descent were also segregated in San Antonio. Indeed, in the early 20th century, racial deed restrictions common to central San Antonio meant that places like the West Side or the East Side 
were home to Mexican Americans, African Americans, in the West Side you had also Lebanese, Syrians, some Anglos, and then after 1917, we also had an exiled group of Chinese migrants known as Persians Chinese. And it wasn't just the neighborhoods that were segregated. Before the 1950s, Mexican school children were sent to underfunded Mexican schools, and access to stores and public accommodations, including theaters, parks, swimming pools, often depended on one's skin color and English language proficiency. In other words, could you pass? Um, some of you have probably seen the signs about no dogs, no Negroes, no Mexicans, or um, we serve whites only, no Spanish or Mexicans. Those are kinds of things that you would have seen in the Southwest, including here in Texas. So back to 1836. Following the overthrow of Mexican rule in 1836, cultural geographer Daniel Ariola describes the emergence of a dual landscape in San Antonio with separate Mexican and Anglo downtowns by the early 20th century. If we can get the map up, I'll show it to you, but try to imagine. The Mexican downtown was located, there we go, okay, there's the map. The Mexican downtown was located to the immediate west of the San Pedro Creek. As described in a 1938 city guidebook, quote, the Mexican district of San Antonio is a city all to itself, existing side by side with the gringo city across San Pedro Creek. Alternatively called Leradito or the Mexican Quarter, this area encompassing roughly Houston Street to the north, Nueva Street to the south, which used to be called Monterrey, so on that map it's Monterrey, uh, San Pedro Creek to the east, and Pecos Street to the west. This was the pre-urban renewal commercial center of Mexican-American San Antonio. This was an area filled with Mexican-American owned businesses, Spanish language theaters, and home to Plaza del Zacate, now called Milam Square, which was a public square known for soapbox speeches and political rallies in Espanol, Streetcars and then later buses connected Mexican downtown to Anglo downtown. And you can actually see on that map a little dotted line along Houston Street, and that's the, uh, street, one of the streetcars. In the 1960s, urban renewal mercilessly hit Mexican downtown, or the area west of the San Pedro Creek resulting in the removal of large swaths of Mexican-American owned homes and businesses to make way for Interstate 10, which is approximately running along Pecos Street on that map. They made way for Interstate 10, the county jail, and later the city jail. Lots of undesirable things. Today, the old Mexican downtown has all but been erased from the landscape with only a few landmarks still standing. The Almeida Theater, the Mercado, and Casa Navarro. I just wanted to do a quick little reminder about the state of the Alamo and the years after the Battle of the Alamo, when it had not yet been reimagined as a shrine. So here it is, 1847, in ruins. In the early 20th century, Alamo Plaza was the commercial center of Anglo San Antonio. And as such, it saw many new buildings come in and evolve to the city's business needs, as well as the city's own understanding of its image in a quickly modernizing country. So here we see the evolution from horse-drawn buggies to the automobile, as well as replacing some older architectural styles with more modern ones. One of the features of Alamo Plaza that was lost among the changes that came over that period was the chili stand. Since about the 1870s, when railroad tourism became a big business in San Antonio, chili stands had been common in both Alamo Plaza and Military Plaza. 
In the 1880s, the construction of the new city hall pushed the chili stands out of military plaza, and some other construction also temporarily moved chili stands out of Alamo Plaza. Uh, and so the chili stands moved west of the San Pedro Creek, where they were mostly left alone in that area next to what's now Market Square. But in the early 20th century, despite the fact that the city had enacted some rules to try to keep food vendors out of the Alamo Plaza area, they started popping up in Alamo Plaza anyway. So this is 1905, uh, right next to the Alamo. They were tolerated in this location for about another decade, but ultimately they were pushed back across the San Pedro Creek. This tension, is in many ways emblematic of the long-standing tension San Antonio has with its Mexican-American population. Tolerated, but not really embraced in spaces like this. Entertainment for the tourists, cheap food for the locals, but not really a welcome presence in Anglo downtown. This is an advertisement from a candy store located directly across the street from the Alamo, the Palace of Sweets at 331 Alamo Plaza. And it illustrates the kind of tension that I'm talking about. As you can see, among the things they sell, they have the famous Mexican pecan candies. But, supposedly at least, they're made by white people only. They like the food. Not so much the people, at least not in Alamo Plaza. At a time when Mexican Americans and Mexican migrant farm workers were frequently described as diseased and blamed for the city's various cholera problems, a clampdown on Mexican commercial businesses in Anglo downtown meant that not only were new ordinances passed by City Hall to limit the location of chili stands, to also outlaw open air food stands and require that any chili stands have more expensive tents under which they serve their food, and then eventually requiring health cards for all of the chili queens. And so you see here, um, this is a chili queen, and behind her are all of the health cards for the women who work there. It meant that by the early 1940s, it was relatively easy for the health department to permanently shut down San Antonio's famous chili stands. And it, it is somewhat surprising. I mean, the, the, the anti-Mexican nature of this is not surprising. But it is somewhat surprising that the city made a move to shut down something that was so popular with tourists. Uh, tourist accounts frequently talk about the chili stands as one of the attractions. So, you know, this is, this is a city that likes its tourist dollars, so that, that was uh, somewhat unusual. And yet, the push against having this uh, Mexican-run commerce downtown seemed to outweigh that. Of course, we cannot forget Fiesta and the Battle of the Flowers Parade, which is so closely associated with Alamo Plaza. Celebrating the defeat of the Mexican army on Mexican soil at the 1836 Battle of San Jacinto, this was a battle at which, remember the Alamo, was a rallying cry to seek revenge on Mexico for the routing the Texians received at the Alamo uh, battle. The parade emerged in 1891 as an event closely linked with San Antonio's Anglo elite with faux royalty that for many years had white-only membership. Um, it's really only relatively recently that Ray Fayo got uh, official recognition, um, even though he had existed since um, right after World War II. And um, there's also, you've probably seen, some use of the Confederate flag um, in some of these events. Here's another photo of the Battle of Flowers Parade demonstrating the kind of military roots that the event is riffing on and also sending a, a message about who rules San Antonio. Of course, there are a great many contradictions in Fiesta from the fact that Mexican culture is celebrated in food and clothing and decorations at the same time that the defeat 
of Mexico is at the heart of the celebration. So it's just a little bit of a confusing thing. Um, but I think that um, it is not just these sort of slights, these sort of little nicks about being pushed out of Alamo Plaza and across the San Pedro Creek, or about being excluded from Fiesta royalty that has communicated to generations of Mexican Americans that they are the real losers at the Alamo. Um, it was also taught to us in school. From about 1928 to 1959, Texas school children were given a comic strip version of Texas history called Texas History Movies, in which people of indigenous, African, and Mexican descent were depicted as stupid, untrustworthy, and lazy, with Mexicans specifically described as greasers and ta um, tamale eaters. Even for kids born too late to receive Texas History Movies in school, that kind of tone was really established in the classroom. So many Texas Mexican American families have stories about learning in school that Mexicans are bad. School trips to the Alamo are particularly remembered as fraught for Mexican American school children. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have picked up this book, Forget the Alamo, at this point. Uh, and I was just going to read a couple of excerpts from that book because in it, um, the authors interviewed some people about their experiences going to the Alamo. So this is from Forget the Alamo. Andres Tijerina, a retired college instructor in Austin, vividly remembers that day in 1957 when, his, when the history teacher called him to the front of the classroom. He said, it was the Mexicans that killed Davy Crockett, he recalls. It's like Andy's grandfather killed Davy Crockett. Tijerina shakes his head, uttering the words you hear from many Texas-raised Latinos, especially those of a certain age. It's the first time I find out I was a Mexican. It's the first time I found out I was different. Tijerina's wife, Juanita, had an identical experience in her South Texas classroom in the 1950s. She says, we felt like crawling under the desks, she remembers. We didn't know we were different until they told us we killed Crockett. For Richard Flores, a professor at the University of Texas, it happened during a third grade field trip to the Alamo itself. Even at that age, he considered Travis, Bowie, and Crockett heroes. It wasn't until he returned outside that the other children began teasing him. You killed them, one jabbed. You and the other Mexicans. I remember that being really uncomfortable, that you don't want to own whatever this past was that has been assigned to you, remembers Diego Bernal, a Texas state legislator, of his own childhood trip to the Alamo. That sucked. That wasn't fun at all. I just remember being a little bit uncomfortable because the sense was that my folks were on this side who were bad and we lost and your folks were on this side and you're good and you won. Professor Rosalinda Fregoso writes of the shame she felt during her middle school Texas history class in Corpus Christi. Mrs. Roy gave interminable heart-wrenching lectures reenacting the melodramatic detail of the Anglo-Mexican struggles leading to, te to Texas independence the noble letter-writing campaign of Stephen F. Austin versus the bloody dictator Santa Ana's wrath, the memorable deeds and bravery of Travis, Crockett, and Bowie versus the atrocities of the treacherous Mexicans, the high-powered artillery rifles and cannons of the villainous Mexicans versus the handful of muskets, revolvers, and the Bowie knife of the heroic Anglos. Sometimes she gazed at me, the only Tejana in the classroom, and I felt her whiteness overpowering me each time she mentioned the cruel streak in the Mexican nature. By the eighth grade, I had internalized a self-hatred equal to the hatred Anglo teachers of Texas history felt for Mexican Texans. And um, What's important to understand is that the Alamo is a really loaded symbol in San Antonio and honestly across the country. For many people, it is a symbol of liberty and courage. 
but for many others, it is a symbol of colonial subjugation of indigenous people, the entrenchment of slavery in Texas, and the disenfranchisement of Mexican rights. I want to end on a slightly more positive note. <laughs> Mexican Americans did not boycott Alma Plaza, and indeed, strolling downtown was a common pastime for lots of people. As a commercial space, we could buy things at stores around Alamo Plaza, but for much of the past century or longer, it has not really been our space. It is a space that we are visiting. I think that in order for us to really understand the legacy of the Alamo, we must also consider the history and legacy of Mexican American labor to improve civil rights, not only in this city, but across the country. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I want to thank the, everyone for their introductions and to Araneta, my dear friend and mentor. I can't say enough about her and what she means to me. And so I'm just grateful to be here. I want to talk a little bit about African Americans and civil rights and also a little bit about what that means. Um, we often talk about, um, and I don't have a beautiful PowerPoint like Sarah did. Um, I apologize. I am, you know, I'm not that old, but I'm kind of traditional in the way that I put PowerPoints together. They're just ratchet. So I'm sorry and I apologize for that. Um, but um, they kind of, you know, these are coming around teaching points for me. But, and as we think about the Alamo, I want us to think about ways to expand the narrative. I grew up in Virginia, and our fourth grade trip was to Monticello. And one of the things about Monticello, which is Thomas Jefferson's birthplace, is that there are many ways in which you can do interpretations there. You can do interpretations of the house, or you can expand the interpretations outside of the house, and also inside of the house and talk about the other people, the African Americans that were living there. And the question at Monticello and Colonial Williamsburg and all of these spaces when I was growing up, because I was born in 1975 and it was in the early 80s, is how do we expand that narrative? And I think that that's where we are at the Alamo right now. I'm not just saying that we're 30 years behind Virginia. I like to think that as a Virginian that we're ahead of everybody, but I don't think that that's particularly the case all the time. But I do think that now we are trying to look at how to expand that narrative. And I want us to think beyond just Alamo Plaza. I want us to think about the broad Alamo narrative. And some people say, when we talk about the broad Alamo narrative, does that mean that it's historical revisionism? No. It means the broader narrative. It means Houston Street. It means a little bit further up the street. The African American community isn't that far away from here, and people are traveling back and forth. And so it is part of this community. And so when we think about expanding the narrative, I think that that's where we are. And so expanding that narrative, even to the Majestic Theater, we're right at Alamo Plaza almost. It's just right down the street. The Crest Building, which is, from my research, the first that was, you know, at least in my mind, the, probably the first that pictures were taken at and that were desegregated right here, right across the street. So. This is the broader Alamo, and this is part of the story. And so let's talk a little bit about San Antonio and what San Antonio is and why San Antonio is important. And I think one of the first things, and I think that Sarah, if I can say Sarah, we always talk first name basis. Um, we, she was mentioning that San Antonio is different than a traditional Southern city. And I often say that San Antonio is neither Southern nor Western. It's kind of southwestern. It's got a different kind of flavor here. And so when you try to look at places like Houston or Dallas or Birmingham or Richmond, Virginia or Atlanta, this is different here. And, and so it doesn't mean that it's better. It doesn't mean that it's easier. It doesn't mean that it's worse. I don't think that's certainly not the case. It means that it's different here. And so in a sense, San Antonio is a city that has a tradition of segregation, but it also has a tradition of a little more inclusiveness within that segregation, if that makes sense. That doesn't mean that we're an inclusive city. 
in the early 20th century or the mid 20th century. It means that there's a little more space for African Americans to maneuver. You're gonna have segregation, but there's a little more openness. And so I want us to keep that in mind as we move through. And so many of the African Americans that were here had some opportunities that they may not have had in Birmingham. They certainly would not have had in areas of the Black Belt, what we call the Black Belt, or certainly not in rural Mississippi and rural Alabama and rural Louisiana. But that doesn't mean that segregation is, is not here. It also has something in, in, in common with cities like Seattle. Seattle's another city that has a tradition of strong segregation, certainly residential ordinances and things like that. But again, we have a little more Southern in San Antonio than they do out in Seattle. And so, in a sense, segregation exists, but in somewhat less obtuse ways than more traditionally Southern cities. Now again, I don't want you to think that it's easy here. I don't want you to think that segregation is not here. But segregation isn't always the same thing for everybody in the same places. It's different in rural areas than it is in urban areas. It's different in college towns than it is in non-college towns. It's different in San Antonio than it is in Austin. And so I want us to kind of look at San Antonio in its special space. Another thing that makes San Antonio distinct is the military presence in a southwestern area. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this more later on, but when you think about the military presence, particularly after World War II, we had a number of presidential, you know, presidential orders that kind of outlawed segregation in the military bases or military operations it became more difficult for the military operations in San Antonio to institute or to continue segregation. And in San Antonio, the military provided opportunities, particularly for military workers that were African American that other places did not have. And so when you look at the early black leaders of the civil rights movement, many of them come out of the military and many of them are working at military operations because they had more leeway to maneuver, more leeway to act on civil rights. The third thing that I want you to think about is that African Americans made significant progress pushing for civil rights from 1950 through 1960. And I want you to think about that. Um, sometimes when we look at civil rights, we've often thought about the collective. And there is a collective in San Antonio. We can, can talk about how an interracial coalition helped push for San Antonio civil rights for African Americans. But at the base of that was the African American community. And without the African American community pushing for it, fighting for it, getting beat up for it, you really don't have it here. And so those are the three things that I want you to start with. And the final thing is San Antonio is not going to be as progressive as El Paso or Corpus Christi, but it's gonna be more progressive on civil rights than Dallas, Austin, or Houston. And so when you think about it, it's that kind of we're at that corridor, south and west, it's a little bit different. El Paso is gonna be the most progressive city on civil rights in Texas. And that's gonna be a 20th century thing. We're gonna talk about how El Paso had the first NAACP. We don't often think about that. It's El Paso. The second NAACP chapter in Texas is in San Antonio. It's not in Dallas or Austin or Houston. And so when you think about smaller black populations in El Paso and in San Antonio, they from the early 20th century were extraordinarily active. So a little bit about the history up until 1930, and I'm gonna kind of push through this because I don't wanna to get too much into the weeds here. <coughs> but starting off is what does the plaza mean to African Americans? And again, this is the broad plaza. In the late 19th century, this is a space where African Americans were gathering to celebrate Juneteenth. Why were they gathering here and starting here and marching to other places on the east side? I don't know that. In the 1970s, they're gathering here again for Juneteenth. And I think this is one of the things that African Americans have traditionally done. Now, appropriation um, has a nasty meaning in this society nowadays. But African Americans have had a history of looking at other celebrations or other spaces and incorporating those things into our own terminology and language and meanings. And so when you think about the Alamo, 
and what that means for African Americans, we have to think strongly because yes, it does mean, in a sense, slavery is at the Alamo. The Texas Revolution includes slavery. It's part of it. You can't escape that fact. But it also talks about the principles or the ideas or the ideology of freedom. The American Revolution is the ideology of freedom. Even though the crafters of the Declaration, most many of them were slave owners. The revolution ends slavery in the North, it doesn't end it in the South, and yet African Americans are celebrating the Revolutionary War because of the ideas and the principles adapted for themselves. It's in the same sense of how African Americans have interpreted Christianity. I talked about the freedom, the social gospel, same gospel in a sense, but it has difference, the interpretations sometimes are our own because of our lived experiences. And so when African Americans are gathering at the Alamo, it may seem ironic, but if you look at it from the idea of liberty, it makes sense because they're incorporating it into their language, their ideology, and they're taking charge in a sense of it. They're transforming it into something different, into something that has meaning and resonance to them. And we think about it, if it's in an 1890s and early 20th century, the resonance for them is this is the period of the lost cause. And Sarah talked again about that period of the early 20th century in which life was getting worse for African Americans and Latinos. And part of that is the, res the resuscitation of the idea of the lost cause that comes in the aftermath of the Civil War in which people talked about the Civil War as a lost cause, but they minimized the meaning and the impact of slavery. And in the aftermath of that, you had this whole idea of what was lost in the aftermath of the Civil War. Well, that doesn't have any meaning for African Americans, but it also leads to the elevation of Jim Crow. It leads to state legislatures pushing for restrictions on voter voting rights. It, it means for many Southern legislatures a push for, quote, states' rights, to determine rights of African Americans, as Southern states decided that they wanted to determine African American roles and rights in their states by themselves. And so this is the period of time in the late 19th century and early 20th century where the beam really comes down on African Americans, and it's levied on them hard. It's the period in which you start to see the second clan arising in the second decade of the 20th century. And life consistently gets worse, and you almost have millions of African Americans disenfranchised in the wake of that. And so when African Americans are gathering in that sense to talk about freedom, I think they know what they wanted because it came at a time in which these same spaces were oppressing them and they're taking it and trying to make it something different. And so when they are gathering up until the 1930s and when they're getting their communities to, together on the west side and the east side and they're developing their art system and they're talking about the ideology of they define themselves in the city as new Negroes people that were not slaves, and they came out of that, and they were talking about elevating their race, lifting as we climb. That was their motto, lifting as we climb. Developing their separate spaces that they were forced to have and making the best out of it. A period in time in which you have life, very few options, but a period in time in which they are taking what, was, what they were having given to them. Now, I talked about the east and the west side. Those are the traditional African-American sides of the city. Traditional industrial zones, low-level areas are where you get a lot of flooding. Um, west side was a little bit earlier than the east side. Um, the west side is a little more integrated than as far as now. East side, by the early 20th century, become the commercial part of the African-American community through men like Charles Bellinger, a bootlegger. East side, Al Capone, some other things, too. Um, Charles Bellinger was an interesting character. But Charles Bellinger also knew how to play politics, and he knew how to work politics. And if you're an African-American, you recognize. Think if you're any part of an underrepresented group, you learn how to work in the, in the space that you have. And that's what he does. He recognizes a segregated town. 
but he also knows that he can work with other people in city council or the mayor to get votes. And he can look at the poll tax, he can pay the poll taxes off and force African Americans who he pays for to vote his way. And people say, well, why did the African American community follow him? Well, what options did they have? And so that's another aspect that we have to think about what segregation means is that when you're oppressed, you have very few options and you have to maneuver within that space. And yet that space is what they are doing on the east and the west sides of the city. Semi-skilled, unskilled positions often except in areas that are traditionally African-American. As I was saying, African-Americans formed their own institutions, the NAACP um, in 1917 in San Antonio, 1915 in El Paso. Again, 1915, 1917. It's an important period of time. Birth of a Nation, one of the most racist films ever done, comes out in 1915. The birth of the Second Klan, really around the same time period. The riot, race riots in the World War II era were emerging in America, um, in other cities, not San Antonio, but throughout the nation, race riots have really intensified in that second decade of the 20th century. And so it's not surprising that African Americans have been radicalized, if you will, or they seek to form their own institutions to protect themselves because they have to. There's no other alternative for them. And so this leads us up to the Great Depression in San Antonio. And one of the things that happens in the Great Depression is that we often talk about the issue of, well, History tells us that one-fourth of people in 1932 were unemployed, and that's bad. But for African Americans, that's 50% unemployed. That's even worse. And it leads to rougher race relationships because many unemployed people who are white didn't want black people to have jobs. And so they would sometimes carry jobs saying, no jobs for black people. They didn't say black people, by the way. I'm not gonna say what they said until every white person has a job. And you think about what that might have meant in San Antonio and the difficulties of the Great Depression, the bow weevil, the issue of the plains. And these were difficult times for African Americans, made even more difficult by policies that the federal government enacted, um, the HOLC, redlining, et cetera, that basically kind of, even though blacks were already segregated, government policies forced African Americans into these spaces. And it didn't allow them to kind of get out or get loans to protect their property, to make improvements, and so it kept African Americans and Latinos, because if you look at the areas that were redlined, it's the south, east, and west sides. It keeps them in their spaces. Whereas areas that were allowed easy loans, the north side, Alamo Heights, Almas Park. Areas that got benefits or access to capital. The areas that didn't, south, east, and west. And so if you think about that, that's another aspect of how government policies, initially well intended, ended up being segregated that have tremendous impact on the African American community. And so this is where African Americans are. They don't have many opportunities to get out of the east side or the west side if they wanted to. Even if they, didn't, even if they wanted to, they couldn't get out. To improve their property, they have to go to loan sharks because the government or other institutions aren't going to provide them with loans. But they have their institutions. They have their schools. They have their churches. They have their community organizations. They have the Carver Library. They have many of the things that the larger society has. And then World War II happens. And then everything, in a sense, changes and moves the trajectory in a different way for African Americans. We think about the civil rights movement starting in 1956. It really starts, I would argue, more towards the World War II era, particularly in San Antonio because of the military um, presence. And you have executive orders issued by the president, 8802-9346-9981. Because of the military impact, there's supposed to not be segregation in military organizations. That doesn't always happen that way. But San Antonio really emerges as a city of segregation without any real legal ordinance of segregation. That's one of the things to remind you about. There's no real legal ordinance of, San, of segregation in San Antonio. It's an understanding. Now, that doesn't, we'll talk about how 
that's not completely true for the 1950s because there is a segregation ordinance that exists for about a year, and we'll talk about that after the Brown versus Board education decision. But the military presence really makes it different. And I've been told that I have five minutes, so I'm gonna to try to move a little bit quicker, um, try to be a preacher and move a little more quicker. Um, and so in 1954, and I'm moving beyond the, Civil, and the World War II era, in 1954 you had the Brown decision, Brown II decision in 55, you had the Sweat versus Painter decision, and there's strong support for it in San Antonio's community. A lot of support in the white community, some support in the Latino community, and the African American community is hopeful. And out of that, you get a lot of changes and things that are integrated or desegregated. And when I say there's a difference in desegregation and integration, but we don't want to talk about that yet. Parks and recreations, swimming pools, initially not desegregated. The San Antonio City Council passes on Juneteenth, 1955, an ordinance prescribing segregation in swimming pools. We call it the Juneteenth Ordinance. So San Antonio City Council on Juneteenth the day that African Americans celebrated freedom passed an ordinance to segregate swimming pools. We won't talk about that. Hospitals, movie theaters by, the night, by, the night, by 1960, lunch counters by 60, restaurants, hotels, and schools. By late 1960, San Antonio had theoretically desegregated many of those. But we'll end with lunch counters, and that's where we are in Alamo Plaza and others. Now, in Texas, Corpus Christi had desegregated some lunch counters before 1960. In San Antonio, Sears had already done it. It's, it's lunch counter before at some point in time in the late 1950s. But in March 1960, you have a larger movement um, in the nation led by youth to desegregate lunch counters. And in, in Texas, you had threatened violence and violence in Austin, Galveston, and Houston. And people in San Antonio were looking at what was happening in Houston and other cities and they were like, wow, this could actually come here. And business owners and, and council of churches and religious leaders came together, pushed by the African American community and the NAACP, Lillian Andrews and Harry Burns were pushing them, saying if you don't desegregate these spaces downtown, we've got 1,500, 2,000 people that will protest your businesses. If you do that, you will lose business. As Araneta said, we closed down some businesses in Nashville that was what was gonna happen here. And so these seven downtown lunch counters were desegregated because African Americans and others pushed for it. But it was a political thing, it was an economic thing. And the media didn't make a big deal about it because they didn't want it to be a big deal. But it was a big deal. And then I'll close with one final thing as we move forward. Just because lunch counters were desegregated doesn't mean that hotels were desegregated. It doesn't mean that restaurants, a lunch counter and a restaurant's a different thing, were desegregated. And it doesn't mean that 50% of the spaces in San Antonio where people could eat or go were not segregated after the lunch counters were desegregated. So when we think about the change that happened in March and April and 1960, it didn't change everything. And so African Americans started to push for a non-discrimination ordinance that San Antonio did not pass until the mid-1960s after the Civil Rights Act. And that pushed San Antonio behind El Paso because El Paso actually passed the Civil Rights Act. San Antonio was unable to do so. So in a sense, San Antonio almost becomes more Southern as we move later into the 60s even though it had been more progressive in the early 1960s because it didn't push the envelope as it once had done. And we can talk about the reasons why, I'm not gonna get into that right now, but we can talk about the reasons why. But as I leave this, I will say that in many ways, San Antonio has a lot to be proud of because we did a lot of things well and a lot of things better than many other space places or um, cities. And yet at the same time, we have a lot of work, we had a lot of work to do then and we still have a lot of work to do. But as I think about this space and I think of the segregation that was here, that's certainly part of the story. Maybe we were allowed here in ways that my ancestors weren't allowed in places in Virginia, but it wasn't integration. And so I'll leave it at that and I'll let the first person perspectives come. And I don't know if we're taking a break now or I'll let you come and take from here from there. Thank you. This is the only content discussion 
where we can hear from people who live through what we're discussing. So that's what we'll be hearing from in now our second session tonight. Joining Dr. Gould and Dr. Lattimore for our panel discussion are Mrs. Dorothy Collins and Mr. Eugene Rodriguez. I will admit to having known Mrs. Dorothy Collins since I first came to San Antonio in 1964 as a newlywed. And she collected some of us young ladies to teach us to be proper bridge players. <laughs> as an educator in the Edgewood Independent School District for 38 years, 11 years as an elementary school teacher, and 27 years as an elementary school principal has been Dr. Mrs. Collins' career. She received a master's degree in education from Our Lady of the Lake University and an undergraduate degree, I have to do this because of my husband, from Texas Southern University. Since retiring, she has remained active in the community. In 2004, she was inducted into the San Antonio Women's Hall of Fame and she is the recipient of the Baha'i Unity Award, which recognizes one's significant contributions to unifying people of all ethnicities. She has a unique reference as well. When she was a teacher in Edgewood Independent School District, one of the students in her first grade class was a little girl named Gloria Estefan. Gloria, as long as I've known Dorothy Collins, I did not know this story until I saw it on the front page of the newspaper when Gloria Estefan came back to San Antonio about 10 years ago. She had a major reunion with her favorite first grade teacher. She said that when she entered the class, she did not speak any English, and it was Mrs. Collins who taught her to speak but she forever credits her as teaching her to read and to love. I can't imagine any more amazing qualities than that. We also have Mr. Gene Rodriguez, who earned a bachelor's and a master's degree in government from St. Mary's University and a master's degree in urban policy and planning from UTSA. He is a principal at Urban Policy Advisors and was recently Senior Urban Policy Advisor for former Council Member Shirley Gonzalez. He, was, he has worked as a consultant for the Mexican American Unity Council, U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, and U.S. Department of Labor. He served as district officer, as he served as district office representative for Congressman Henry B. Gonzalez, and was a captain in the U.S. Army and served in South Korea. He may not have known Gloria Estefan, but he's got a lot of credentials here. <laughs> I'd like to ask, uh, are you going to come here to speak, Go Dorothy? Again. OK, yes. thank you. Ready? First, we're going to hear some words of comments from Mrs. Collins and then from Mr. Rodriguez. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I'm speaking from experience. I don't intend to insult anybody, but I want to give you some facts. I want to tell you something about the Alamo, what I thought about the Alamo. I came to San Antonio from Houston, Texas in 1955. I was aware of the significance of the Alamo from reading and hearing stories about the Alamo because it's an, an historic Spanish mission and fortress compound founded in the 18th century by Roman Catholic missionaries. It was the site of the Battle of the Alamo in 1836 where American folk heroes James Bowie and Davy Crockett died. I remember the son growing up in East Texas, Davy, Davy Crockett. Reflecting back, I would have to say that as a product of my environment, 
My beliefs were more in line with my exposure. As you interact with people in different settings, gain more knowledge through reading and education, your views shift. As I journeyed through life, I was objective and made every effort to substantiate my beliefs by gaining, gaining knowledge from a real historical perspective, often as told by members of the community and through literature or media. As I continually read and explore every avenue to ensure that I uncover, uncover as much as I can in the way of factual, accurate, and current information. We're all aware of the Alamo, but it's necessary that we tell the entire story. We must never lose sight of the sacrifices and contributions made by blacks who were enslaved and forced to sacrifice themselves in the defense of the Alamo. We need to work side by side and appreciate each other. We humbly ask you to please include perspectives on slavery in the new museum. Now let me talk about growing up. I was born in East Texas in a little town named Nacogdoches. And we have the old stone fort there. And of course, you know, Stephen F. Austin University. And growing up, yes, we were segregated, but we didn't pay much attention to it until we were in school. We got the used books, the books from the non-black school. And that's what we had. We didn't get new books when I was in school. Now, you know, that's long ago. <laughs> But anyway, I didn't get upset. We didn't get upset because our parents told us to always be kind no matter what someone does to you. Do the best you can whenever you can. Do not get upset. So I didn't get upset. We didn't get upset. We studied hard in school. We conjugated verbs, we did everything. The only thing I found out, we just didn't do enough science. But that didn't stop some of the graduates from going on to college, majoring in biology and so forth. But it stopped me. I became an elementary teacher and I learned a lot there. But one thing about our educators was that they told us, do the best you can at all times. Please study hard, and we did just that. And there were many things that we did. We know we got used uh, football helmets and what have you. And so what they just gave us in Nacogdoches. But they built us on the campus. It was a beautiful school, elementary, junior high, and high school. They built us a campus where we could entertain singers who would come there and sing. But in a small town, Garrison, Texas, they built a gymnasium. We played basketball, and we had to play on the campus dirt. But we survived, and we played and won a lot of games, too. I'm saying all of that to say this. Even with getting used things, we, we just did that. We just listened, and we just accepted it. Another thing I want to tell you is that I could go to the bus station, and this sign said, for color only. You know, I've been color, Negro. I'm not going to say that other word because I'd get angry. <laughs> I've been color, Negro, black. 
So I don't mind what I'm called as long as it's done with dignity. And I'd be there at the bus station and this sign said, for colored only. So that's where I had to drink my water. And if you got any food at the bus station, you had a separate place to sit. We got on the bus when I'd be going to Houston or St. Augustine to visit relatives and what have you. And no matter how many empty seats were in front of us, had to sit the back seat. And you know, about five or six can sit back there. But we just lived with that because we know, and we knew at that time that everybody didn't hate black people. They were just going on in those days. But we had a lot of encouragement. And then I decided to go to college because my mother and daddy encouraged me, but they didn't have to. They said, we don't want you doing the hard work that we're doing. You know, the chief occupation in Nacogdoches was lumbering. And my daddy worked at the sawmill. And my mother was a maid, as we say, domis domestic engineer. But you know, she was loved. She would take trips and look after the children. But we know about segregation. But we didn't hate people because we know that, and we still know that there are good people who care about us. I went to college. While I was there, there was segregation. But you always meet people who care about you. And I got a job babysitting. And then Dr. and Mrs. Laura had their friends to bring their children over when they were getting together. And they would just pay me big money and I was happy to get it. But all along, I wondered, when would we be treated equally? Well, we're trying now, but I think we're going backwards. We're having trouble with the voting. We're having trouble with other things, but we'll survive. I don't have a 10 minutes, so I better hurry. I also want to tell you that in the 60s, when they integrated the lunch counters without any problems. I was one of the ones helping the young people pick it handy handy because they wouldn't hire blacks as cashiers or in other positions, good positions. Finally, they did, but they're out of business now. I also picketed Joskis. There I was at sacrifice and bought an expensive watch, all diamonds. And a lot of us were spending a lot of money at Joskis. Joskis wouldn't let us eat in the Camellia room. And so the NAACP decided with the youth group that they were going to pick it. But a lot of the older ones joined them. They lost business and they opened the Camellia Room and they started making money. And so didn't any of us close our accounts. We kept working and kept buying it at uh, Joskis. Now, I said all of that to say this because I'm going to tell you about what happened in San Antonio in 1963. We had faculty desegregation. Before that, all the black teachers had to teach at black schools. And I can remember, even though San Antonio is unique, Dallas-Fort Worth don't have 17 school districts like San Antonio. We are very unique, but we haven't had any problems, not that I know of with our integration. So in 1963, there were only three school districts in Texas 
that integrated the faculty. Guess where they were? There were seven teachers in El Paso, four in Odessa, Texas, and five in San Antonio. Out of all the school districts, only two school districts integrated the faculty. San Antonio Independent School District pulled out four black teachers from the all-black school and sent them to the different schools. Edgewood sent me <laughs> over to Winston Elementary in 1963, and that's when I taught Gloria Estefan. It was right there by Kelly Air Force Base, and almost all the children who attend school there were military. And so that's why I had a chance to teach her. Slowness of faculty desegregation in Texas was noted in the Houston Independent School District. In 1965, of 200 schools and 9,500 teachers, only six teachers had some degree, only six schools, I'm sorry, had some kind of degree, faculty desegregation. Guess how many were in Houston and they had all those students and schools. Only 17 teachers were selected. San Antonio did not publicize it. They wanted to see how things were going. We didn't have any trouble. So then the next year they started sending black teachers to the other schools. We never had any trouble here in San Antonio. School desegregation shocked the black teachers, bringing vulnerability to dismissal without notice and demolition without consultation. Now that wasn't here in San Antonio. It was in the smaller towns and what have you. So a lot of them were unhappy about the desegregation. But mother always said to me, study and prepare yourself so that you will be ready when opportunity knocks. Knowing that statement is true, I realize that every day is an opportunity to share my gift of love. I've always known to be myself if I ever hope to be somebody. But let's keep in mind that good leaders are lifelong learners and I'm still learning. In about five months, I'll be a nonagenarian. I'll be 90 years old. I know you know what it means, I just said it. <laughs> right now, I'm 89, so I'm an octogenarian. I'm still going. But I want you to know that when I first started teaching, we didn't get the same salary as the non black teachers got. But Gilma Aiken came out and the foundation, and finally we all started getting the same salary. But some school districts paid more, especially San Antonio at that time. San Antonio was the largest school district in Bear County, and Edgewood was second. But now it's Northside, Northeast San Antonio. And Edgewood is at the bottom. We've lost a lot of people, a lot of students, but it's still going. Integration of the lunch counters. It was long overdue, but they didn't have any trouble, so that made it real nice. And I, I could go on and on and on, but we don't have time for that. But it would be exhilarating joy for me to see the civil rights story in the museum on the plaza downtown. You know why? Let's tell the story. Tell the story. You're not gonna hurt anybody's feelings. We all know that we're trying to improve things. And I just like to tell you, I appreciate Mrs. Pierce asking me to participate today and I remember that Bria told me I have 10 minutes, 
and I might have gone over my time, so I better sit down. But I want you to know that there's a little mantra I live by. I read it somewhere, but I'm paraphrasing. When you start aging, what do you do? You get up, dress up, and never give up. Thank you. Ms. Collins, you should know that I joined your, your age group uh, this year in February. I turned 80. <laughs> and um, before I turned 80, I thought I was invincible. Once I turned 80, everything started falling apart, but <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> you know, I was in a group of about, I think it was six of us that integrated this theater for the first time in 1961 after we had demonstrated uh, for months, it was several months, uh, starting in 1960. But I wanna share with you a little bit of what got me to the point of being one of the individuals that integrated this theater. I was, at the time, a student at St. Mary's University. My dad was very active in the community, had been in World War II, uh, member of LULAC, uh, he, didn't, he didn't go to college on the GI Bill, he was an entrepreneur. He worked at Kelly, but then set up his own business. But he was very active in the community, a, a follower of Henry B. Gonzalez back then in the 50s. Uh, and he taught me a lot about equality and how one should help the other. He. I'm the oldest of eight, but he managed to get us all through Catholic school. And I always remember the mantra of the, what I learned in Catholic school. And those of us who are Christians know that uh, the parable about the Good Samaritan traveler who reached out to what was the enemy to help someone who was not close to him. And that always stuck with me. Not that, not that others were enemies, but they were different. And you still reach out to them. So I kept that throughout in my Catholic teachings. And when I went to St. Mary's, I uh, participated in a fraternity that was, it was uh, supposedly a chamber of commerce type that helped rather than party all the time, although we did our share of that. But when uh, the Joskies picket started, our fraternity decided to support those pickets. That was, uh, I was a freshman. We came down to Joskies. We petitioned Joskies. I remember going up the escalators to see the management of Joskies and indicate to them that they should open up the commuter room. And, and they had integrated their basement lunch counter, but not the Camellia room, which was the fancy restaurant, as you recall, on the second floor. Uh, we made national news, as a matter of fact, because you have this Catholic school fraternity doing this. We caught hell at the university. We found out later the reason we caught hell is because we screwed up this long-term negotiations that we're doing to Joskies that have a big endowment to the university. And we messed all that, all, that up. But in the aftermath of that, the student uh, movement was growing in terms of the lunch counter movement. And uh, I recall very distinctly that several of us were getting together and then a, about two or three individuals came from UT Austin who had to teach us the nonviolent method. And I remember very, dis very distinctly, speaking of the Alamo and, and, and the Texas history, is one of those who was a, a recent student, a graduate, that taught us was Sam Houston, <laughs> who was related to Sam Houston, uh, which I felt is ir somewhat ironic in terms of what we know about the history back then. But we were taught uh, the nonviolent method of Martin Luther King and Gandhi, which was 
things like do not wear any rings in case you're going to be involved in any kind of disruption. Do not wear any rings, no phones, nothing that's sharp. Uh, and if you're accosted by anybody, just walk away. Right? So what was our target? Our target was the Majestic Theater. It was the best theater in town. So why not go for the best, right? So several of us in, started to get together and we decided the, the approach we would use is that we would, there, by several of us, it wasn't just St. Mary's students, it was students from every single university in the city and several high schools. And we would get together and where would we meet? We'd meet downtown in the county courthouse because there was a judge, uh, uh, Charlie Grace, who later became, I think, county judge, uh, who left open his, his uh, on a Sunday, would leave open his courtroom for us to gather, and we'd gather there, and we would pair up our, in every, every team, there would be at least one black. And we would walk from the courthouse to the Majestic Theater, and we'd go to the ticket booth that we all walked by, and we'd go to the counter and ask for tickets. And we would be told, if you were not the black person, you can, uh, we'll sell you a ticket, but we won't sell him or her a ticket. They can go around to the back to go up to the colored balcony. So we would say thank you and we would leave and we'd, we'd walk away. But as soon as we walked away, another team of students would hit the ticket booth. And at, at, at the peak of the demonstrations, which, which was on Sundays for months, the line would go all the way around St. Mary's past the Empire, even past uh, St. Mary's Church over to the Aztec. That's how long the line was. Um, there were people across the street on Houston Street, across the street from the Majestic that would be heckling us all the time. Um, and also people that would be driving up and down their car, with their cars. And at that time, there was also the issue of the communist scare. And there were those who were saying, all those kids are being influenced by the communists. That's what all this is. It's a communist taking over. And there was one well-known communist in San Antonio, I still remember his name, John Stanford. And a uh, very quiet man, and somewhat of an intellectual. And none of us, in the group knew who he was, never seen him, except one person did, and that was Henry B. Gonzalez Jr., who was also a student, my same age. So, what, and we decided that if John Stanford, because at times we had people that would join our demonstration and also follow through with the same process. And uh, so Henry, Henry Jr.'s role was to stand across the street with all the hecklers, and if John Stanford got in our line, he'd give us a signal and we'd break up because we did not want the media to say there was a communist in the group, which would prove the, those that were opposed to us that were, uh, would prove the fact, of course, it was communist generated. As I said, it went on for, it went on for months. We did it for months. And then finally, uh, and I don't recall all the details, quite frankly, I guess that happens when you turn 80, but, but you're 89 and you still have a great memory, so <laughs> I hope I'm, when I'm 89, I have that same memory. Um, I remember that the, the decisions for the Majestic were being made in Dallas, because that's what we were told all along. That, so it wasn't the local managers that were keeping the blacks from uh, coming into the ma majors uh, theater, it was those people in Dallas. So finally, the people in Dallas, I guess they got tired of us demonstrating. Uh, and they said, finally, uh, we're going to let you integrate, but it's got to be quiet. We don't want a lot of publicity. We don't want it to be all over the newspaper. Well, we accepted that. And there was, I think, six of us. I don't remember all of the individuals that were able to do it. It was uh, myself. Some of you may know, uh, remember Bill Donahue, who was um, an assistant city manager for a while. He was one. Uh, 
and he, he was the liaison with the uh, junior NAACP, if you'll call. Uh, uh, right. Um, and then there was the former uh, San Antonio Housing Authority director, uh, Apolinar Flores, Apolonio Flores, uh, and his girlfriend, and they were both students at Breckenridge High School at the time. And the other two, I don't recall. So we, it was quiet. Uh, we, I don't even remember the name of the movie that we saw. I don't think I even saw the movie. I was so excited just to be there. Uh, but, uh, and from then on, it was, it was, it was integrated, right? Uh, so I went on to do several other things, always with the idea in mind of the, the need for civil rights and equal rights. And uh, when I think back, after I turned 80, you know, what, what good did you do in your life? You, know, you start thinking about that. And clearly I feel that my part of that was something good. Thank you. Thank you, that was wonderful. Hearing from experience is sometimes the best teacher. There is a saying that was actually said by um, Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist. He said, power concedes nothing without a demand. Never has, never will. And so I think that to all of you, it is uh, an important reminder. I have a few questions and I'd like to really, this first question I'd like to hear from as many of you on the panel as possible. So if you could just kind of answer the question and, and let somebody else have a chance, it would be great. Considering all the problems of the past and the advancements made and that we still have ground to make, what recommend, recommendations do you make to advance us further in the area of civil rights? And I'm gonna start with you, Carrie. You would. <laughs> As a historian, I would say we need to know our history and to understand it fully and for it to not be always politicized. I think one of the things that we've done and we've become more of is we politicize our history. We say that's right or that's left. We should just dig into the history for what it is and let it take us wherever it goes. And I fear that we are moving in a direction for where we've politicized it to the point that we're not looking at history as it was. We're looking at history for how we would like it to be or what political agenda it fits. And so to me, to, to push for civil rights, we have to have a foundation of understanding our history. Thank you. Sarah? Um, I absolutely agree with, with Dr. Lattimore. I, I think that we not only want the public at large to know U.S. history fully, Texas history fully, but it's important to me that all people do feel seen when we talk about history. So um, I want to make sure that in attempting to correct myths that we don't alienate people, um, we all we all have history, and, and I think it, it's all um, equally fascinating, equally interesting. It's great to know what is that other perspective, right? This is this perspective I have, but what is that other perspective? And it enhances your own understanding of yourself um, and enhances your understanding of the community that you live in. So I hope that when we talk about expanding narratives, that we figure out how to do that without alienating people because that, that is in fact not the work we're trying to do. We're trying to bring everybody in. And that doesn't mean we all have to exactly agree, but, um, but having those multiple perspectives really brings a richness and a depth to what we know. And you know, the thing to know about history is it is incredibly messy, which is what I think makes it kind of fun. Um, so I think particularly as we're thinking about this museum for the Alamo, thinking about multiple perspectives, um, thinking about ways that visitors can 
um, integrate their own stories, family stories, personal stories into it. Um, those sort of interactive things might be fun. Um, but I think we also just have to be open to the fact that probably whatever goes there should probably not be considered permanent. It should probably be considered something that evolves over time because we get new evidence every few years, believe it or not. That, that's why history is always, that's why there's new books <laughs> because there's new information. So um, we just need to not be so rigid in the way that we think about history. I think those are two good answers and in the interest of time, I want to get uh, your thoughts on a little bit more uh, Mr. Rodriguez, it says, San Antonio is often referred to as the cradle of the Mexican-American civil rights movement. Is that true, and why is that? Well, I think it is true because um, the national uh, movement on civil rights and the national organizations basically were founded here or were closely connected here. Um, LULAC, GI Forum, well, that's where Corpus comes in uh, with Hector Garcia. Uh, and of course, the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund, uh, and uh, throughout, uh, particularly since, ever since 1950s or even before that, after the, the Second World War, when when so many Mexican Americans uh, came back, decided that they were not going to live the way they did before. They got educated. They became professionals, lawyers started challenging uh, issues in the courts. Uh, all of that sprang from San Antonio. And even to this day, San Antonio is looked at th throughout the country, in my view, as the heart of the Mexican American community, particularly the civil rights movement. Thank you. Dorothy, Mrs. Collins. Dorothy's OK. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know how often you come to Alamo Plaza, but if there were a civil rights museum there, do you think it would give African Americans more of a connection with the plaza than they have now? Or what do you think? Ask me one more time, please. I'd like to know what you think of about the fact that if there were the, the civil rights story told at the Woolworth in the, in the new museum, do you think that would give African Americans a better feeling of connection to that space, to the Alamo, than they have now? Oh, yes. I think it's very important that you inform the public of what is going on. And I think it would be real nice to have something in both those places where people can actually see what really happened and the changes that are, make, that, that are going on. A lot of things now are going back to what we used to do. And we're hoping that they improve, like for voting, for, for civil rights, Civil Rights Act was passed. 1964, look at it now. So I think it'd be very good to have the information in those places. I'd like to hear any other panel members uh, address the same question as relates to either the African American community or the Latin American community. I'll start. Um, okay. Wherever we have a museum, I think a museum is important, but I would also say that, and I want to be careful in how I say this, I want to make sure I get it right. <laughs> African American history and Latin American history, Native American history is all integrated into the whole. And so I don't want to see us resegregated in a sense like Black History Month. I love black, and the history of Black History Month, but sometimes for me, the only time when I was in school that I heard about black people was during Black History Month. I want to see African American history, Latin American history, Native American history integrated throughout the whole Alamo experience. I don't want to see it just in one space. I want to see it in all spaces because that is American history. All of it is American history. And one of the things that we've done is, I think in our time period, 
we've so much said this history, that history, this history, that we forgot it's our histories and that our histories are intertwined with one another. And we've got to find a way to unite that to tell a full story. So yes, I believe in a museum, but I don't want to see everything about African Americans tied up in that museum. It's got to be throughout the whole for me, because if that's the case, I don't want the museum. I'll just be honest. Let me hear some more comments. Is there a? I, I, I would just add, thank you. Being able to walk into a museum as a um, seven-year-old child of color, or whatever that may be, and seeing yourself somewhere in there, it really matters. It matters even if you're 40 years old to walk into a place and see yourself somewhere in there. And so I definitely like the idea of seeing that integrated throughout because there really is no way that you can talk about San Antonio history and not talk about all the different people that are here, right? Um, pretty much right off the bat, uh, when the Spanish uh, decide to create a settlement here in 1718, there's already a bunch of different Native American groups with their own histories and cultures and languages and all of that. And a lot of the soldiers who they brought with them, again, I, I mentioned this in my talk, this wasn't exactly the most desirable assignment if you were in the military. You were out in the middle of nowhere, it's kind of dangerous, you know, you were one snake bite away from death at any time. <laughs> so it was not really the most uh, desirable place to come. And yet, so, so what happens is you, you get a lot of soldiers who, if you look in the early uh, census records that the Spanish kept on the soldiers here, you get a lot of soldiers who are uh, uh, marked as uh, mestizo or mulato or that sort of thing, and then over time, because they've, they've been here in the frontier and kind of paid their dues, they, they get whitened, and so now they're, they're Espanol. But the point is, this was always a very diverse city. So those later census records and once you see a bunch of people listed as Spanish, it doesn't tell the full story. This was always a really diverse place. And so we want to make sure that, um, that kids, adults, elderly people, they walk into this place and they see themselves and they see themselves throughout that story because it's not like, oh, African-Americans were here and then suddenly they, they disappeared after this one event, right? No, they're always here. Just like indigenous people, always here. Mexican-Americans, always here. And so that, but I, I will just say, it, it is one of these things that um, we all, you know, in, in my field we always say, you know, Mexican-American history is U.S. history. African-American history is U.S. history. We want to make sure that everybody knows that. Thank you. I think those are... Two good answers. We have time for one more. Yes. Well, I would say that, that one of the missing uh, elements of what I've been following uh, is there doesn't seem to be enough attention to the, in the indigenous community that has lived here for many, many centuries. I think that there needs to be appropriate attention to that. And the other is the real life that, that Tejanos um, experience right after the Alamo, which was a life of harassment uh, and even death uh, because they were hated. And so that Juan Seguin, who was mayor, had to leave to go to, Me go to Mexico to escape and save his family. Uh, and if that, if that is not told, appropriately, then we're not telling the real story of the Alamo. I would like to thank all the members of the panel. That has just been very, very informative and incredible. Uh, in, in closing this part out, I would like to, to say I often quote my dear friend, Maya Angelou, who said, the truth is a stubborn fact. Maybe I've said that to you before. We are living with a lot of untruths. And we can't do anything about 
the past. We can't even, you know, you shouldn't, we're not asking you to sit there and feel guilty or any such feeling because of the past. The past happened and it really happened. And you hear it and you see the remnants of it. But the museum and the plaza now is being redesigned on our watch. We've got a lot of very disrespected Mexican-American citizens and African-American citizens who are disrespected because of the lack of truth of their stories. This is our watch. This is our chance. We take responsibility for what happens after this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Araneta. And so now, as we bring our final content session of this summer series to a close, uh, we'd like to, you know, in addition to the, the comments that we just heard from our tri-chair, Araneta Pierce, uh, we'd like to invite some comments from our other two tri-chairs, uh, tri-chair uh, Rebecca Virgan, and then tri-chair Sue Ann Pemberton to close out our session for the evening. So, tri-chair Virgan. Thank you all very much uh, for the incredible uh, information and history lesson again that you gave us today from the first person perspective. Thank you to uh, Las Casas and Majestic for hosting us here and for giving us the tour of that area. And this, although it is the last scheduled content discussion meeting, our work here for the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee is not over. I just wanted to reflect on one portion here about our histories being intertwined and that it's messy and it's dramatic and it tells a great story. And what other story do you want to hear but then the messy drama that it is. And we can draw a lot of people to the Alamo and to San Antonio because of it. One thing that I remember a lot is people ask me a lot of times, well, where's your family from? Where'd you come from? Are you from Mexico? Well, I tell people that I'm from here. This is my community. This is my area. The, the term, we did not cross the border, the border crossed us, is an actual fact because of the history and because of the political drawing of lines. So this is another way that we can tell that story to all of the community who comes and visits us. Um, thank you for the rem reminder that we are not here to, also not here to alienate people, but to invite people into all of our stories. And this is what we're working on. So in the spirit of expanding and enhancing the narrative and creating depths, um, we are, of course, we are not done with our work. Following these content discussions, uh, I know our consultants and our teams have a lot to go through and a lot of information to digest. And we, as ACAC members, still have more work to do. We will be gathering um, next month yes, September is next month, we will be gathering together as a whole committee next month in September, as well as in October, to go through some more work that we have to do. Some of that work will be um, listening to the uh, museum architect selection process, discussing and reviewing some of the archival investigations, looking at um, having a committee discussion on what we've heard here um, so yes, please be sure and review all of those other YouTube channel videos that maybe you had missed and weren't able to attend, as well as hearing from our interpretive design process, just an overview of what is happening. We are going to have these discussions. We are going to continue our work and thank you for being committed and engaged in this process. It has been my honor and will continue to be my honor as we work through this. And now I would like to pass it over to our longest serving tri-chair, Ms. Sue Ann Pemberton.
Well, we've learned a lot in our summer school sessions, that's for sure. And we are left wanting to know more and wanting to discuss what we have heard. Our consultants have also been listening, and so we want to discuss with them what they have heard and listen to what they've heard. We all need to revisit the vision and guiding principles and the themes, I know I do, so that we can move forward as an advisory committee in discussion with our consultants. I hope you have enjoyed our content and learning sessions. I know I have, even if at times they were uncomfortable. Since many of you have been part of this process since 2014, you know that some of those discussions were also uncomfortable. But we, <clears throat> excuse me, but we worked through that by listening to each other and respecting each other. I expect nothing less as we move forward in these next steps. Thank you for your time and commitment to this process. We will have a far richer understanding of this special place for all people. Thank you. On behalf of the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee, thank you for joining us. The stories of the Alamo are layered and complex. We hope this session has provided some insight and will make your next visit to the Alamo more meaningful. We look forward to continuing these conversations.